That's right. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the show with no name. Uh, back with the squad. They're back from NYC. Got Bob here as usual. And Charlie and Don- Whoa, Donnie. Uh, he just unlocked the bomb. Uh, more. But r- real quick, Charlie and, and Donnie, you guys are back. Uh, we had someone film for you last, last time, but quick vibe check. How was NFT NYC? Yeah, NFT NYC was basically a great confirmation that the that the Bitcoin takeover of like all other events that aren't exclusive, exclusively Bitcoin is real. Like the ETH Denver phenomenon continues at NFT NYC. I didn't even go to the NFT conference. I just went to the side events and... It was also really validating because there's a lot of really smart, good people in New York, and we were able to to kind of gather at natural shelling points like Pub Key or some restaurant. So, um, yeah, the the ordinals phenomenon is not just an and a, a one time off East Denver event. Nope, and. Um... I'll echo that and say that it was like packing a month worth of stuff into three or four days. I don't think I've ever been that busy or that pulled in so many directions. Not only did we sponsor a bunch of things, but like there were so many other valuable spaces to be in full of people who have things I want to hear when they talk, you know what I mean? And uh, every time I go to any conference, I go to the conference because everybody else is like, why would I go to the conference? There's not an ordinal's booth. And I'm like, I should go to the conference because there's not an Ordinals booth. I want to know what's going on in the outside world. And I thought this back when I was like into Solana and I wanted to see what Ethereum was doing. And I think it's really good to get a diverse perspective. So I never listen to anyone when they say, don't go to the conference. This is the one time I should have. It was $620 for a ticket. And there was, there literally isn't a conference. There were like six booths. There was one tapestry in the middle of the room. It looked like they just were breaking down for the last hour of the last day, the whole time. It was it was truly offensive. I was livid. I walked in and I was like, why is this the most expensive conference? And it's like it it's like they didn't even they like sent one of the interns to help a few people set something up. It was like truly offensive. So everybody out there, when people tell you not to go to the conference, don't usually listen to them. This one, pretend it's not there. It's just it's a temporal meeting space. That's all it is. The venue is like it was truly offensive. It, NFT NYC is a good forward-looking indicator for the trajectory of NFTs on other blockchains, and the Ordinals space is a good forward-looking indicator. These the in-person events is a good forward-looking indicator of the energy that's on uh, the mother chain. It is wild the the disparity between these two uh, uh, movements right now. I, lo- I love it. We're coming out guns blazing. Pew Pew ETH was the test net. Uh, okay. I'm just making fun of the Thank organization of the conference. I wasn't saying anything I, about it. The, I saw photos and I'm like, I can't tell if this is just the one shot where you showed up at 6 a.m. or if this is like at 4, but uh, yeah. It was miserable. It was really miserable. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, and then we got a guest on the show today, Mr. Matt Luongo. How you doing, sir? Doing all right. Uh, very loud AC behind me that we'll definitely fix in post-production. Uh, but, uh, yeah, doing okay. Thanks for having me, all Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Um, so, yeah, got a couple of topics. This is going to be kind of almost like a philosophical episode. We're going to go deep into kind of game theory type of stuff. Um, and I think the first prompt is something that you said, Matt, at Youth Denver on stage. There was like an L2 panel. Got heated at times. You mentioned some things about like fee burning and it got a little testy. But one thing that you kind of, sounds like you brought up, but you can make sure I get the framing right is that there's this question about what is, what's better for the long-term security of Bitcoin? Is it making sure the miners get paid maximally? And this is things like L2 is passing fees down to miners and this incentive alignment, if you will. And then there's another side of optimizing for holders, which is where things like fee burning can actually be net benefit for, for holders. And which one benefits the long-term security model of Bitcoin? Um, so if that's right, I'd love to jump into this kind of topic and give us some other color about this framing. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, look, I have some strong positions, but they're loosely held, right? I can, I can be convinced. But it has been about a decade that I've built this position, so m- maybe it'll take more than just this call. Um, so m- my thoughts are this, right? Before the block size debate finally resolved, um, 
we all gave, we treated miners like they ran the network. And um, that was wrong, right? We had like a really nice object lesson that uh, miners don't run the network, users run the network. And the economic majority ultimately decides what is Bitcoin. And, uh, and for, you know, not for you guys, but, but for other people listening to this, you know, what happened was um, the miners, the miners got pushy and they, they aligned with a bunch of um, application developers and corporations. This led to this New York agreement and this like Segwit 2X idea uh, that ended up being a, a failure. And, and the thought was it was a compromise between, okay, we're going to activate Segwit, but we're also going to have a, a two megabyte base uh, block size increase. Um, so, so a doubling before Segwit. And, um, you know, Segwit 2X for me, I was a big blocker. And, uh, but it for me was this clarifying moment where I was just like, this is messed up. Like, there should not actually be people in a shadowy room in New York talking and making these decisions. This is ridiculous. And the precedent that it sets can't. Like, I, I, I you know, I'm an application dev, and so I, I want it, give me more network, give me more space. But but after this, I, I became a small blocker, basically. It took me a little bit of, like, licking my wounds, but I just realized, like, that's that's messed up, and we cannot possibly, this isn't the system I signed up for. And the thing that, that helped Segwit2x, uh, that made sure it failed, ultimately, was something led partially, uh, uh, this movement led partially by Luke Dash Jr., which is, um, which is this idea of user-activated soft fork. And so what UASF basically said, and I'm just like broad strokes, is, um, yeah, if you guys do this, we're all going to go. And, uh, and we don't really care what the miners say. Uh, we can go nuclear, we can change the proof of work, we can do all sorts of stuff. And it was this threat, and we didn't see it play out, thankfully. It would have been a mess. But it was this threat that really held, uh, it, I, I think it's what tipped uh, everyone to, to not support uh, 2X. Also, there's a bunch of other issues where the code base was garbage, and I'm glad we didn't activate it because it would have broken Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, there's a lot of other. They nuked their first block. Like yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it, it was a mess. But, like, the learning for me was, you know, um, you think one group has power, and, but eventually, like, Bitcoin is, is FU money. And this was a beautiful demonstration of like, uh, you know, and, and so one of my takeaways from this is we saw a bunch of people basically exit Bitcoin and some of them did it for good economic reasons and some, some of them did it like spoiled children. And we, we saw a little bit of both, right? Um, we saw we saw miners who got less involved in governance because they kind of got their hands slapped. We saw some exchanges, I won't name any names, who pivoted pretty hard away from Bitcoin and never really came back. Um, and so it was a huge lesson for me. And like, what is the role of a miner? So if we believe that proof of work is what I think we all believe it is, which is a permissionless way to, uh, to basically progress the chain, but that the rules of the network are enforced by nodes and the nodes that matter are the nodes that have economy behind them. They're the nodes that have uh, personal value uh, and, a, and a use case behind them. Then ultimately... What matters is what the economic majority wants. And miners are about progressing the chain and making sure that uh, if they're censored, someone else can step in their place. So for me, that's the beauty of proof of work that we don't get from other, other mechanisms. So if we think all of that's true, well, the miners work for us. They don't control what happens on the network. And uh, so that, that brings us to L2s, right? Anything with an L2, any, any talk of an L2, any, even, even a meta protocol, we're, what we're talking about is we're changing what people get paid to do in Bitcoin. And that's kind of a dangerous thing. So in the same way that it's dangerous to add an opcode that could lead to a bug we didn't have before, instability, it's dangerous to pay people differently. So for me, I'm like, okay, when I look at merge mining and, and basically anything that has sensed Bitcoin consensus, I'm like, great, so now we have a party that's completely... Un, maybe unaligned with the network that's bribing miners to do things that maybe aren't good for the network. And so that's my concern. And if you look at, look at something like Ethereum, who's going to decide if there's a major contentious fork? So we know what happened in the past. It was like developers. But today, um, you know, USDT and USDC have a lot of say over, over what fork is real. And I don't want to see that happen in Bitcoin. And so that's why I'm interested in okay, how do we how do we reward the economic majority rather than 
routing miners. Sorry, it's long winded, but there you go. I I think I generally agree. I say like economic participants and majority. I say like Bitcoin security and consensus derives it we've seen it derive historically from like node participants and economic participants. I still kind of wax a little bit like uh mystical about it because I I like to say that we've seen how it has worked, but we don't know for sure how it will work. Um I would hope that security would derive from the people actually using Bitcoin. I even go so far as to broaden the definition of people using Bitcoin to people holding and stacking Bitcoin. Um, I, uh, I am, I'm actually myself, I'll probably take a little bit of a, of a, of a flip on Matt's, uh, perspective. And I actually think miners do participate, will participate more in the future than they historically have. Um, I think probably the next soft work may not be miner driven, but it will have a much larger role from miners play in it just due to the fact that, um, that, uh, I think it's going to require a lot more hash rate buy-in uh, than before. So previously, like the 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 block says, were you had all the hash rate concentrated in the hands of Gian Wu, yeah. and uh, and maybe it's not quite the same anymore. But uh, I think we do have a little bit more different landscape. So yeah. So Matt, what's your what's your thought on the long tail issuance? Uh, you know, do we keep do we change the the block subsidy uh do we add something like an eip 1559 uh to to bitcoin i'm i'm, I'm curious on, on i love how you're just you're just laying these mines out for me to just like just just step right on to yeah thank you yeah um look uh, uh where i got were i able to make changes uh to bitcoin that that were not controversial yeah, maybe, maybe there would be a, a tail issuance, but I'm not. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's like, I can't do that. And I think that it's completely untenable. Like, I, I don't I don't see any change uh, to fee mechanisms outside of extensions on other layers. So uh, I, I, I'm looking at this two ways. If you're a Bitcoin L2, um, and you're, I mean, uh, you know, the, they'll say there are three or four, but I look at it two ways. If you're a Bitcoin L2 and you're like, okay, how do I, uh, for, first of all, I'm going to skip over the de- definition of L2. Um, because I think that all of that is BS. So what I'm saying is if you're an economic layer, which is my preference, um, then what you need to do is like... Economic layers, meaning you contribute fees directly back to the L1? Is that... That's what that's what matters to me, is you contribute fees back to the L1, and the question becomes... Like, there's a little bit more in my head, but like the question becomes how. Like, how do you contribute back? Sure. And um, yeah, for me, like what, what I... I mean, we just we made this term up because we were looking for a way to categorize work we're doing. And it's like, what does economic layer mean? It has to use Bitcoin. Like it can't be some other asset that you're using for gas and stuff like that. That's, that's not cool. Um, it needs to, and, and then value needs to accrue to L1, but it also needs to accrue to Bitcoin holders. So in our particular case for designs we played with, that means Bitcoin holders staking or Bitcoin are earning more on it. So things similar to routing fees on lightning. Um, but but for me, the important thing with economic layer is like, okay, is this net positive for Bitcoin? Because you can imagine a world where a merged mine chain is not. Yep. And um, so to avoid that, I see two two ways outside of like minor bribes. And one is a burn, which pisses everyone off. Uh, it's a great thing to say on a panel. Um, and uh, and I and I'm interested in it. And I think the only problem that I have with the bird, I mean, for one, anyone who is involved with counterparty knows like you're probably going to regret burning Bitcoin later. So I think that's one one issue is just like uh, no one wants to be a historical laughing stock. Um, but I think the the other issue is like uh, the amount that you can actually impact Bitcoin's issuance through a burn. It takes a you have to be very big for that to actually be much of an impact. Um, so the other idea that I like here is uh, well, okay, if we're concerned about long-term consensus stability why don't you just lock bitcoin up anyone can spend for like 20 years make it 30 make it 40 and and it, and it starts to become it's this it's effectively the same as burn for a short-term market cycle you're taking things out of circulation um but miners can't really uh complain anymore because right now their complaint is no no, no, no we're, we're very aligned with the bitcoin network and you're like you're very aligned with the asics you owned 
right? Which is almost the same, but it's not the same. And um, and if you really want to be aligned, uh, show us that you're like a, like a not a, like a, a a big net seller of Bitcoin, which is obviously impossible as a miner today. So so I think a, another way to say it is like no no, no we're we're, we're going to give you the bribe. You're going to have to stay in business for a long time to get it. Interesting. Can I ask a question? Of course. This might sound stupid. I, if Bitcoin is a network where miners are financially incentivized to do the thing that people are paying them to do, and eventually the subsidy, you know, the Coinbase runs out and it runs on transaction fees because, like, it's all too expensive at that point. It doesn't really matter. What What are we worried about breaking? Or I guess what territory are we worried about stepping over if we just let it go the way it's going? Like, why why do we even have to have these conversations? I mean, I'm interested in you guys' takes. I, I'm i not uh, an alarmist necessarily about the security budget. Um, I think that we have been doing various forms of cope on the budget almost since day one. And uh, Nick Carter has some killer writing on this, but most of most of that cope does rely on price appreciation. And I think the reason, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be frank, I'm not an NFT enjoyer. What I loved about ordinals is fee market. Like that for me was like, hell yeah, we finally saw some move. So um, I think the question is just like, if you look at ordinals, for example, fees, it's very spiky. And what you don't want is you don't want a fee market to be spiky and then to have just like incredibly slow blocks and like difficulty using the network for, and retargeting, it, it expanding. Um, but yeah, you, you guys might have uh, more of a take here than I do. I'm the same way as you, Matt. Um, I feel that it's been largely uh, not terribly concerning, although I was actually mostly concerned that we had not been empirically demonstrating a use for Bitcoin's block space and a general rejection of, like a cultural rejection of like, let's do anything but the Lightning Network. So... Um, to me, that's why I even really got most interested in ordinals in the first place, because it be, it opened up this Pandora's box. And the first thing that flew out are JPEGs, but many other things will come out of this box, both scary and amazing. And and that is what makes you very excited. So I to me, the you know, if you are you to be long ordinals type ideas is 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 like one of the most optimistic things for, you know, fending off the the tail issuance, uh, uh, I, you know, voices in the room. Like the question I always, sorry, I, I, I'm like the youngest Bitcoiner in here. Not like I'm age wise. I'm probably, I'm probably one of the oldest people all the time everywhere I go. Um, but like, I've been paying attention to Bitcoin the shortest amount of time. So my viewpoints are not really, maybe they're not colored by old school Bitcoin thought, but they're also really not in, as informed as old school, school Bitcoin thought. Um, so the tail issuance argument always seemed kind of strange to me because by the time we get to the point in 120 years or however long that is that that is occurring, the block reward is already minuscule to the point where transaction fees have long since hopefully taken over for that. So even considering that conversation at this point in time just seems so absurd. But I guess if every time the block reward goes down by half, everybody goes, is it going to be enough? And it's, it's always been enough. Why do we think it's not going to be enough if we're using the network more, right? That's, it's that's where my brain is going to be a concern. Like this is, it's just big one has to demonstrate that it's not a concern. So it's, which it always does. Yeah, it, it always so far. Yeah, and so far. You know, I like to think of it as like, is the having priced in? Of course, it's not priced in. Is it? By most of the world, of course not. No. And but a different way to think of it is like we talk about how Bitcoin's monetary policy is sacrosanct and doesn't change. It changes every four years. And so I would think of it like that, where it's like, uh, yeah, it is different that now there's a happening with an ETF. If you look at where money's flowing, that is a very different thing than it was. And I, and so I don't think that like, you know, there's, you know, next having or two havings or whatever, everything stops working. But, uh, but I do think that we have to be, uh, we have to help make sure there's a fee market. Like, we can't just be like, oh no, no, don't don't build on Bitcoin. These things will just solve itself themselves. It's it's uh, it's math. Like I think that's pretty, you know, kind of mid. And and I, and I think that um, it doesn't mean we need to change the issuance schedule. 
but it does mean that like, well, we, we need to, we need more ordinals like things. We need things that keep block space rivalrous. For sure. Thank you. Uh, jumping back just a bit to the economic layer idea. I really like this idea. Uh, what did you say were like, there's a, there's a spectrum essentially for any given layer on the, uh, you know, economic, uh, value that they provide to, to, to Bitcoin L1 directly. Um, you mentioned, uh, directly contributing to minor fees. You know, if you're like as a roll up, if you're storing data on Bitcoin L1, I mean, that's op obviously a win if you are maybe like uh facilitating layer one transactions in some 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 fashion um and then you mentioned like 30 40 year staking uh, well yeah know? sorry I, I i went everywhere let me get really tighter so for like the for the economic layer what i'm trying to say is uh like if you wanted to qualify for this and like look i don't have like a bitcoin layers thing i'm launching or anything so i'm not i'm not Bitcoin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't get to announce my editorial policy to everyone like who's like, yeah, sure. But like if I were, <laughs> what I would say is like I want to see economic alignment out of these projects. Yep. So what that to me means is you were using Bitcoin as your base asset. You are uh, contributing to Bitcoin's economic security. So that could be through straight up merge mining. That could be through burning. That could be through like a long time locking up Bitcoin for future miners. I think all of those are interesting options. Um and then the other one for me is uh, like, yeah, Bitcoin holders need to make money on this thing, not just like in general, because like number go up, but specifically, where is value accruing? If some of the value is not accruing to Bitcoin holders, we, you messed up. Like if it's accruing to just a bunch of people you airdrop yep. token to, and that's it, you you probably aren't aligned enough. Yep. I just really like this reframing. I don't. I, I don't think in the LT space, like people don't talk about economic layers. They don't talk about economic incentives. Uh, it's actually a pretty refreshing take for me, uh, having explored the, the the large majority of of layers on Bitcoin. Uh, it feels nice to frame it in a new way, and this feels like appropriate to me. Yeah, I mean, it, another way to look at it is technical alignment. And that's the rut we've been stuck in for the past like six or seven years now. Yep. Is uh, and that's not like a slide on lightning at all, because uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of the work that that all the teams there have done. It's just like that is one of the most difficult ways to solve some of these problems is this channel based, uh, uh, you know, basically state layer, and um, and so like, and, and we just need better words than whether or not something is an L two, and whether or not you have unilateral exit like. Both of those things are, are, they don't really add a lot to the conversation, you know. Now, uh, it, it, are a bunch of ETH holders making money because of your Bitcoin L2? That, I think, is a really interesting discussion to have. Mm. What if, uh, just just really quick, what if we take Lightning? What are the economic uh, benefits? Uh, so, uh, lightning so I'll, as, yeah. I'll be a, like a Lightning apologist and like not. So I'll, I'll try to take both sides of this so you and I'm not telling you where I am. I'm just telling you what I've heard. Over the years, what I've heard is I've heard that, uh, look, lightning, uh, like settlement transactions are long-term going to continue to contribute uh, economically to Bitcoin security because people have to settle, whole yada, yada, yada. And what I just saw was, well, block space was congested and it made lightning a lot harder to use. And the other thing that we learned about lightning is that in a high fiat environment, it's probably not acceptable for non-custodial onboarding of new users. Custodial is fine. We've seen it have product market fit, but we haven't seen it. So, like, if we wanted a billion people tomorrow, if we like had Bitcoin, we could like airdrop to all of them. Like, cool, you've got Bitcoin now. Like that, we're like Roger Ver before his turning, before the great. You know, we're like we're we're just like out there giving giving money away to people. We don't we can't do that. Lightning, and um, it's just it doesn't it doesn't work. And I'm not saying that these uh, other supposed all twos necessarily can, but it's just a different approach. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't know if Lightning will uh, long-term be really good for the economic security of Bitcoin, but I do know that if the fee market does really well, Lightning struggles to onboard new users. Um, and so that's uh, that's kind of unfortunate. And, and a good person who would come in here and would argue about, like, channel factories and stuff, but I'm not educated enough to be that person's son. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. Uh I want to double click on double click on this like passing fees down from an L two to an L one because 
people will use terms like bribing, which I don't fully know what people mean by that. But there's like two pieces. There's passing fees down to the miners, and then there's accruing value to the holders. Um, and there's different, like merge mining passes them down, and then liquid as a federation just holds them, and they stop there. And so I could I could see like if Solana worked perfectly and the bridge was relatively trustless, um, I could see Solana being a pretty huge value add, even though it breaks the passing fees down model. So that one feels more important than the other, but I'm curious about that. How do you guys? I mean, I think if anything pays its tithe back to daddy Bitcoin. Cool. It's funny because... Right, yeah, I mean... Okay, so it's, it's, it's funny just because that brings up like the joke that like uh, that the ETH folks have, which is Solana is an ETH L2, and which is now inverted where Solana is saying, well, maybe ETH, maybe some of your L2s will become our L2s, wh- whatever. Um, I do, as I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate what Bob said. I like this, I, this, this different framing of it. I've, layer two has always been a very failing term, but it's, it's, uh, it's very easy to, you know, to talk about because everybody knows what you mean. But I think the definitions, there there are some teams out there even trying to work on strong definitions of L2s. It it it, it doesn't really work very well. Um, yeah, I I, I well, don't like this idea. I don't know. I, does Solana does can Solana pay Bitcoin base layer fees? Possibly. There's probably a way to do it. There yeah, there are some complications if you're bridging to Solana like. You have to pay Sol as your gas token. That's not great for the for the Bitcoin economic thesis. How are you actually facilitating any Bitcoin transactions at all other than bridging, which is probably, you know, doesn't really qualify there. So then when are people making Bitcoin transactions? Like where are the Bitcoiners actually winning? I mean, it's hard to draw that picture in the straight just bridge to Solana, now interact on Solana. If it's not rolling up of some kind back to back to the Bitcoin L1 or paying fees or I don't know, doing more Bitcoin stuff. I think uh, I'm going to have to go back through all of the Bitcoin L2s and then layers and do this economic incentive. Uh, have, have you done any of this work, Matt? Like, I, of like, course. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't, I feel bad because I don't want to like, I can't speak for all these other teams and things change. Most of it's not live and yada, yada, yada. But yeah, I mean, the, a little bit of the work that I've done. So like Solana, imagine, uh, imagine that some of its emissions, like native emissions, just like, bought and burned bitcoin sure. suddenly solana is like a tithe paying i don't know economic layer if not an l2 um and uh i mean yeah and then you you look at some of and i'm going to stop naming names because it feels too petty but you look at some of uh some of these l2s and it's like are your fees going to ethereum um which is which has been a common candidate um so like they're they're saying well this is like a bitcoin l2 but but then there, if you if you dig, it's like, where are the fees actually going? So I think that's like uh, probably something that I personally want to avoid. Um, but another really interesting take is Babylon. So what Babylon's trying to do right now is get Cosmos chains to use Bitcoin to basically do time stamping and to solve like certain like log range tax and other issues with their proof of stake. And uh, I actually thought there's no way in hell uh, a chain team would say yes to that. Because, like, why you're kind of giving up, like, part of your sovereignty. Um, actually, it turns out some of them will. And they only will because it's Bitcoin. If they were doing that for ETH or for Sol or something else, there's no way. Um, but for Bitcoin, they're like, well, it's, it's Bitcoin. It's, like, the, it's the one thing that keeps running. And I think that's the most important part about the Bitcoin network is that it gives us that economic certainty. This thing will keep running. And uh, so I, I, I was actually shocked to hear I won't out the cosmos chains but i think they'll out themselves soon that they actually want bitcoin uh supporting their security yeah cool can i ask another dumb question probably are actually dumb question you gotta be someone dumb watching too right um so when we talk about network like bribing the miners isn't that what every transaction is there's two two parts to this and one yeah is that and it, are they all bribes then yeah totally yeah i mean i think it's the whole discussion about um what is meb and what is like the what's the game design like working as it's intended, right? So like here here's like a really clear example. Finance uh, lost uh, I don't remember the date, but they they lost a bunch of Bitcoin, and uh, uh, there was a proposition that maybe they would bribe the miners to reorg. So that's clearly a bribe, right? That is a 
please go treat this other chain as your tip and mine off that. And we'll pay you so much that the hack didn't happen. We fixed the hack. And so I think a lot of us would say, like, we don't want that behavior. Like, we want that to happen as infrequently as possible, right? So every transaction at some size can be MEV and can be a bribe. And, and, and obviously bribe is just like, that's like, just like a slur for just like paying miners to do a thing. It's just like, is it paying miners to do the thing we all expect them to do? Or is it paying miners to kind of like work outside the system? And so like, take it a step further. Hey, mine on this chain to keep, uh, because this is where my, uh, stable coin will have value or mine on this chain, because I want to get in this NFT mint or mine. On... So I think that's where it starts to become kind of dangerous. And I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin space, I, like I just saw this term, MEV, like in, in evil, like instead of MEV, it's like evil MEV. Um, <laughs> and I mean, we learned, right? Yeah, it's good. It's, it's catchy, even though I can't say it out loud, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, we, we've learned from a lot of other chains what MEV can and can't do. Um, but in Bitcoin's case, if people will really start orphaning blocks, it, it, it's, it's bad. And the... One B then is what is the intent? What should be happening? Is what should be happening just what can happen? Because that's sort of what like Bitcoin's nature is. Bitcoin's nature is to accept the largest bidders doing and not really tell us what's good and bad about it. Is it like even a rational conversation for us to have about what it should be or should we be helping yeah. it be what it becomes? Whatever that is. What do, what do you guys think? What are you on the, on the filterer debate? I have a feeling I know where you land, but. Just to, I don't know. just to really quickly quote Donnie here, Bitcoin is not the arbiter of justice. It is the facilitator of reality. That quote will go down. That's, that's like that's fire. A, that is that's fire. Down, like that's, that's the, that's the new maxi line. And I, you know, recapture this term because it's like the, the, the new like hardcore Bitcoiners are like more aggressively advocating for Bitcoin's permission list than the old guard. It's kind of wild. So, um, look, uh, to be clear, I'm, 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 I'm on the, like, no filters, fuck off. Uh, if I can pay for block space, I will, etc. I'm just looking long term and I'm like, okay, just imagine a world where like the largest major exchange chooses which of these forks and in, now in the world that I would hope, I would hope they try to do that. And the rest of us are like, absolutely not. And we choose, and we choose the, other, the other chain. So that would be my hope. But, but when it happens in little ways, that's where it's hard. Because there's not a big moment where we can all socially come together and, and say no. So this my, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Charlie. Oh, Matt, this gets right at the heart of like a lot of the software conversation right now. Because a lot of the urgency behind, say, the op check template verify people or the op cat folks is saying right now if everyone to avoid us having to use custodians for bitcoin we have to we have to do something different with bitcoin and um so this yeah the way you reduce the power these centralized exchanges have in the future is by not ossifying today because if we ossify today bitcoin uh goes into the hands of the coin bases and the black rocks of the world the flip side is if we don't ossify, Bitcoin also goes into the hands of the coin bases. And so I, I, yeah, super sympathetic to your point. I just think that both, both are dangerous because like, how do we, how do we have a system that's changing? That's not captured. As Paul Maudib says, they're the narrow path. Exactly. Exactly. My argument again, probably uneducated against that it would be possible or frugal or even attractive for Binance to decide to like, not 51% of the time, but like, you know, if you have enough money to move the system, the system becomes yours and thereby the system is valueless. The system becomes Binance. Exactly. Is, so like, it's sort of, it always has seemed to me in the back of my head, maybe I'm just like an optimist in terms of like Bitcoin's ability to just shrug off whatever anything might throw at it. But like, if I had enough money to 51% attack Bitcoin, I wouldn't waste that money attacking something that I'm going to devalue by attacking it. So like it just, that sounds good because you're a long-term thinker, right. but but it's not but always. CZ actually tried to do this. Like this was on the table, and he was trying to figure it out after this hack. Like this, ju this happened, and it's like, uh, you know, if this whole if Bitcoin survives because we're all low ego, Bitcoin's not going to survive. 
Like that's not, that's not, that's not, you know what I mean? So like, uh, you, Donnie are clearly like a, a modest person. And I'm like listening to you. I'm like, you're like dropping fire quotes and you're like, well, this is an educated, but here's this complete fire. Right. So, right. So like, you know, yeah, if, if we had more Donnie's, I agree, but like, and, and I, and I don't know CZ, so I, I'm not even trying to make an attack on his character. It's just like, we're talking about billions of dollars. And it, and that power being really concentrated by this exchanges and and now by the ETF and so I think um, yeah Charlie I I think your your point is topical with with Dune but also like really good because like it's like if we if Dev becomes so active that uh, you can like make a change and it hits the network in the same sort of time frame that Ethereum or something like Zcash changes it's not going to be good we really need a, a slow path and for me if I see soft forks start landing and it doesn't take two years to get consensus i might be out or at least i don't know i gotta figure out something to do with my life because um because that's that's it gets into like uh the fed territory like who made this decision where were they were they in new york was there an agreement one one other filters take for you matt uh is a lot more products start coming out like slipstream uh where you they accept non-standard transactions is there a path in the future where standardness rules become eliminated and you just have consensus rules? I think standardness rules are silly. I'll, I, for me, I think they're silly. I don't, I don't, uh, I think uh, as someone who tries to build interesting things on Bitcoin, I'm constantly running up against this. And it's like, uh, you know, uh, if, if it's important to you, make it part of consensus. And if it's not, don't. So I, I think that they're like a social flex and, uh, I don't like. It. Yeah, yeah. Nice take. It it should be like on the node level. If you're running a Raspberry Pi, yeah, you can you can check that box so your Ben pool doesn't crash. But otherwise, just go exactly. So, yeah. Uh, okay, I want to take a hard left turn. We just spent 40 minutes deep diving. This was fantastic. You can't find these conversations anywhere else. Donnie, you got your flowers as the resident philosopher king. So hell yeah. Uh, but now I so this was like this was mid midwit to the right curver conversation the past 40 minutes. Now we're going to go the opposite side and go full degen and talk about runes and uncommon goods. And I'll, I'll give the preface I can and that you guys can fill me in. But as far as I know, the first rune to be etched is going to be called uncommon goods. It's going to start at the halving when runes goes live and go to the next halving. It has an uncapped supply. And so there's this kind of a game theory of like the cost of an uncommon good is the cost of a transaction at some level. Um, that's really all I know. I don't know anything else about this, except for like, you know, hearing a little bit about Casey and Spaces. Um, you can etch one per block, correct? And it's non-fungible. Wait, below one per wait. transaction, right? No, one per, sorry, one per transaction. Is that what it is? One per transaction and you not can, one. I, I thought it was one per block, but I read it about it last night, so I'm not the best person. Not the same. I think you can mint, not etch. Um, etch is like deploy. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah et, uh, and, and then minting uh, with runes, every runes transaction, uh, sorry, every runes action, whether it's etching a token or minting a token, is one-to-one -one tied to a Bitcoin transaction. So you can do multiple mints for a rune in the same transaction. You can do as many Bitcoin transactions as you want in the same block. That's okay. Per, um, it's one per transaction, and he hasn't etched yeah. or deployed the rune yet, but he says that it's going to be hard-coded. Maybe it is hard-coded already. I've actually verified it. Is. It is. A single, yeah, it's a single uh, uncommon good ticker dollar UG, we assume. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not divisible. Every you can essentially mint one uncommon good rune token every Bitcoin transaction, um, and it is hard coded already. You can see that there's the block start and there's the block end. It does have a max, uh, but the max is two to the one hundred twenty eight, which is the theoretical maximum for all all tokens, and it's just in there because it has to be in there, I guess. Uh, all tools of the universe, something like yeah. that. It's like the same number, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, people have estimated total supply just based on how big a runes transaction is. And uh, I think it's around, what, 20 billion? It's like 2 to 20 billion total supply if all Bitcoin transactions just minted UG token for the next four years. 
So supply is going to be less than that. Yeah, yeah. So, so what do you think is going to happen then? Because like the the something we talked about with BSK twenties is like that race to the finish was very enticing for DGENs. You know, once you cross like fifty percent minted, it's like a race to close it out. Hopefully, price goes up. Obviously, as we said in the previous episode, like BSK twenties easy to deploy, easy to mint, hella hard to transfer. Good for number go up. Uh, but what do we th- what do we think is going to happen with like a four year supply of just like it's a box and DGen in the beginning, lol in the middle, DGen at the end. Like, what's what's the play here? Okay, out the gate, who knows? It's clearly driven by mania and speculation. I'm most interested in what happens a year into this, because in such a scenario, it's the dominant rune. I don't see that it ever becomes like not in the pantheon of runes tickers. In such a scenario, what's like? How many bites does it take to 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 uh, how many bytes or weight units of block space will that take off? Theoretically, any economically rational Bitcoin participant would mint runes by default with a Bitcoin transaction, every transaction they broadcast, when the fee rate is, makes sense based upon the sale price of that rune and the and the the fee rate times bytes they take it up uh, to to include that optional op return. So this actually creates a really interesting like side market, fee market to regular Bitcoin transactions, which we could see. I like to like speculate, but like we could see this become a like a driving force of how wallets even calculate fees or even how wallets a year or two from now even like make like fee rate estimation logic. This is something which is a very simple, dumb idea, which could really impact the incentives on Bitcoin. It blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, it kind of has the same problem, but I'm figuring out the mechanism, so just y'all tell me if this is dumb. But it kind of reminds me of people who say, um, like, yeah, Bitcoin is the price of the electricity that generated it. Yeah. That's obviously not true, right? That To that person who generated it, there was a, a floor. They we know that they thought it was at least worth it to yada yada yada. But like it, but it's a, but it's a price point. But it's not like a. It, but it doesn't like have long term staying power necessarily. And so I wonder if that's like I guess what I'm getting at is if people keep using uncommon goods, and there continues to be interest, it would make sense that it would be kind of like an oracle for price. Yeah, it, if they keep using it, it's like how miners have demand response. Uh, strategies based upon the the variable price of their power versus the price of bitcoin we could see basically block space demand response in the terms of uncommon goods being minted crazy there is it's your sorry go ahead Buck. no i was just gonna say i don't i don't see any like near-term strategy for uncommon goods other than i've seen whispers of people doing like the first 10,000 uncommon goods minted as part of like a 10k collection of sorts. Uh so there is some hype there where people are speculating as as people do like who who wouldn't want to own one of the first 10,000 of the very first hard coded rune token that, you know, assuming in 4 years that we're all still here, you know, doing this show once a week and ordinals are a thing and uh and 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 runes are still a thing. I mean, uncommon goods will be like the ultimate OG runes token, uh, massive supply. Uh, if you were here early, you could get it for free, bit almost. Um, so I don't know. There's there is some like first 10k speculation happening, and people will probably go for it, especially because I don't think you can mint a rune before it is etched, and you have to etch it in the block, and so. Uh, Although I guess if you etch it in the block, then you can mint it in that block because as long as your fee rate is lower than than the etching, then then I I think you can. So you, yeah, you could etch or mint any kind of token in the first block. So yeah. So, so here's my question to bring all this conversation back. One, who do you think is going to buy the first block and just fill it with uncommon goods? Like who is going to buy an entire block, fill the entire thing as a marketing stunt? And then hold all of them and assume that that drives it to the moon. My bet is nobody. Uh, yeah, 
It'd be very expensive to do that. It'd be very expensive. And this is that kamikaze pilot theory we were just talking about earlier. Who has enough money that they want to potentially devalue the entire experience by spending all that money to control the experience? Because then it kind of isn't what it was supposed to be to begin with. Doesn't mean someone won't do it, though. Right. The flip, the flip side, though, is people pull stunts like this at other chains that it costs millions, millions of dollars because the stunt is such good marketing. It's a global consensus mechanism. So everyone using the chain is suddenly impacted, right? And so it's like, I mean, we used to have people pay to, to share their engagements in, in OP return. Why not? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's expensive. I'm not saying I have the change in my back pocket. We're just saying it's doable. There is a, a reasonable likelihood that there is some conglomerate of DGENs, runes tooling, marketplaces, and mining pools, you know, put all of them together. And now you have people that are all incentivized to get a chunk of runes tokens. Imagine that you can not only get a bunch of uncommon goods, but you can also etch the first 10 tokens, the first 10 runes tokens, the first 100 runes tokens. The first 500 rune tokens, and you could uh, mint a whole bunch within that block, and then you can distribute all of that to the to to the people in your you know group. Um, I don't know. It seems like there's likely something here that could happen. If that group doesn't exist, should we be that group? Ha! Huh. Right now, right after this, we're gonna get on a call. And we're gonna figure it out. The 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 thing that this brought up in my head that sort of goes to a different. Did you hear what Johannes did uh, yesterday or two days ago? He's the guy who forked mempool into orbpool.space and allows you to like look at Ordinal's transactions. He is he's set up a protocol where if you make the lock time on a transaction 21, which means that the transaction broadcast wouldn't clear until after block 21, which has already happened, so they, there's no delay on it. Um, when you do this, it automatically generates a cat whose coloration is determined by the feed structure. So like, there's now this protocol that is... You can you can basically mint a cat with an unlimited supply, and again the same dynamics play where there's like there's a first ten thousand, there's a first hundred thousand, there's an unlimited supply potentially. But every time you're doing anything else, you can set the lock time as twenty one. It won't change anything about the transaction. You can get yourself a cat with the color pertaining to the fee structure. That will Power nest one, one, user. One, one caveat: I thought that it's a twenty. It's kind of like what Matt was saying earlier of like you can lock it to forty years in the future with the lock time of the transaction. I think that 21 is it's locked for 21 blocks. So it's locked for a few hours, and then you can transfer and spend it. And the way Johannes said it, and this is, again, I don't know. He said that when you put the lock, it's not a lock time, it's a lock block. So anything after the block that is listed there will be sent. So, it, oh, there's never a delay because it's waiting for block 21, which has already happened. That's the way he verbalized it, but maybe there's a language. Yeah, so it's, 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 actually, on, it's actually on chain, but, uh, but it doesn't actually lead to a lockup. Just means your wallet's going to be a pain in the ass. It's a lot of wallets won't know what to do. <laughs> Got it. So I have the following question. What sort of GUI changes are we going to see in very common ordinals wallets that are going to allow you to like mint runes and make cats and do all these other things according to all these new protocols that are coming out on Bitcoin when you're already did, like when you're at the end of the transaction or broad, about to broadcast it and you're choosing the fee, is there going to be like mint a cat or uh, mint uncommon? Like, is, is someone just going to be doing this stuff? Or are they going to do it? Yeah, you? like I don't know. It's just it's exciting to to see. I think yes. Why not? Why not? Why not? Uh, it does increase block space, but if there are economic incentives to tack on additional things, you know, if you're inscribing an ordinal, why not add a little opera turn and mine some of the latest degen runes? You know, why not add the twenty one to your to your lockup and, and get some cats? Uh, it feels like. Especially with meme coin, uh, meme coins going crazy. Like, why not, as you transact, earn memes, the memes of the day? Uh, it feels like the perfect, perfect opportunity. It's like Candy Crush. Yeah. You don't really need a reward. It's just fun. It's the noises make it. Asset heterogeneity on Bitcoin is one of the most fascinating and terrifying things ever. And it's almost, we let the cat out of the bag. We can't. Yeah. We can't put we can't put the genie back in the bottle, but um, I think the discussion should be over how much heterogeneity is okay. Um, not is heterogeneity even possible? Because we've clearly demonstrated that it is inevitable. Then it's a damn. It's a idioms. So much, top to bottom, it's so much ellipse.
so much pep. You got to settle down, Charlie. That was that was a little too uh, fantastic for this for this group right now. I was waiting for him to say we're going to do a little magic. I was just waiting for it. <laughs> um, but on on the topic of like you slap on an operator and get a little bit of extra value in that transaction, that does seem like if you play it out long enough, it does start to hurt fungibility because you have two different assets of sliding value. And so I wonder, like currently, everyone kind of has like your ordinals wallet, and it segregates fungible sats with other types. But there's no easy way to like uncheck that. That's a that's an advanced feature for users currently. So I assume that the two lenses, ordinals lens, fungible sats lens, will in the future be like you click it and it's gonna d not delete, but like it won't recognize your op return rune and just go back to sats. That seems like how it's going to play out. Well, the the nice thing about runes is you can just consolidate. Um, it's not like permanent bloating. Uh, even within the runes protocol, you can have a whole bunch of runes, UTXOs, that you can just smash together. And so then you don't have like extra sets sitting around. You just have one UTXO that can manage all of your runes. Uh, so that's like the main, you know, runes doesn't bloat the, the UTXO set idea. Where BRC20, like Ordinals, still recognizes BRC20 Mint inscriptions for all time and eternity. And so it's just going to sit there. And you actually have to uncheck, like, I don't care about these things. Don't index these things. Let me spend these things for them to be able to be, like, you know, aggregated and, and sent out. All right. Uh, that was an hour, guys. I think this is a good time to call it. Fantastic episode. So that's the pod.